folks. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Performance Series. This is Chris with Microsoft. This is episode, I believe, four in the series. And uh, in the last episode, we talked about uh, some of the reasons to scale a graph and reasons to scale a counter and some basic troubleshooting methodology and, uh, you know, looking at sympathetic and parallel type counters versus inverse counters and looking at patterns and, and just using those for uh, you know recognition of when there's a problem and what might be causing it. Uh, we also touched really really lightly on a very important concept on, on how we we do the troubleshooting on a performance system and that is the whole step one we got to figure out which part of the system bottlenecked and then we got to dig in on that and that alone to figure out what is causing the problem. So the, the, the place we're going to start is disks. So we'll cover all the different commodities, uh, but we'll, we'll cover them one at a time in, in various different episodes. Some will require more than one episode. Uh, but today's episode is about disks and not an uncommon problem at all to find, especially these days, in a world of lots of virtualization and lots of SAN. And, um, the reason that I, I speak of those two things most specifically is because this can cause some issues in troubleshooting performance, not just from disk perspective, but sometimes uh, the problem is not really with the system you're troubleshooting. So you got to rule that out. So you have to add that into every mix. It's not just a matter of A, what of the four things bottlenecked, B, what caused it. Uh, there's a kind of a, an A and a half in there where you need to make sure that it was actually your system that caused a problem. So imagine this scenario here. You've got a, uh, uh, a whole rack full of servers all attached to one big SAN and one little fiber channel switch in the middle who just can't keep up. Uh, if that's the problem, you're going to see disk latency when another server in the rack starts to overwhelm that fiber channel SAN. You're going to see latency, but you didn't create it. So why troubleshoot processes on your system? Why even look at the processes on your system? Your system wasn't the one that caused it. It was that fiber channel SAN, and specifically it was another server in the rack that actually launched off some database maintenance job or something like that, right? The same is true for virtualization in the exact same way. If you've got a hypervisor with a whole lot of VMs on it, all those resources are shared, including access to the disks, whether they be locally attached storage or on the hypervisor or something remote. Uh, it is something that is outside of the purview of, of Windows. All Windows saw was that it uh, had latency. And it's important to define latency too. That's that's a big piece of this. So what is latency? Latency is simply a measure of when when Windows goes and puts together a packet of data to be sent to a disk or a job to go get data from a disk, the latency is the amount of time that it takes to get it. Specifically, what it does is when an ERP or an IO request packet uh, goes to a disk, it's very much like a TCP IP packet, and when that gets sent out, as it leaves the thre the the, the, the uh, uh, the visible threshold of what Windows can see. Once it leaves Windows field of vision, uh, think store port, think driver level, uh, it, it timestamps that packet. When it returns, it takes a delta of that timestamp and that is latency. We call this average disk per second read and average disk per second write. And here in Task Manager, you can see it as the average response time. And in Perfmon, there's uh, ways to measure it there as well. So these are the most important counters we have. But let's take a moment to kind of look at something here. I've got this task manager and that task manager. And why do I have two task managers up? It's because, well, this is a VM that you've been looking at. And now we're looking at the task manager on the hypervisor that's actually serving it. So this is the latency measurement from the host perspective. And that's the latency behind its perspective. And as you can see, it's D drive. And the reason for that is because the entire world of that VM, his hard drive actually lives on the D drive of this machine in a little VHD file. And as a result, it is completely at the mercy of the host to keep that disk available for the VM. Uh, and if the host is having disk bound problems, all the VM is going to see is a lot of latency. And a lot of people will make the mistake of jumping in and looking at processes to see which one is creating the most uh, you know, data on that drive. And as a result, they make a mistake and they'll go pick the worst defender on that box who was not guilty. He was just trying to do stuff and blame it on him when in actuality the issue was on. 
this. So there's some counters to measure this stuff, and these counters are uh, uh, what we're going to cover throughout this episode here. So we'll get our Perfmon launched up and going. I'm going to go ahead and create a user-defined data collector set. We'll call this IO bottleneck. We're going to create this one manually. We're going to call this uh, performance type counter and we're going to add in our key indicators and our secondary and our tertiary counters. All right, so what I would call to be uh, important here are the two objects, physical disk and logical disk. Now, these measure the same stuff for the most part, with a couple of exceptions, uh, but this measures at the actual disk level, the whole disk. So if I had three drives on this disk, then it would see zero, because that's the disk number, and then uh, C, and I keep forgetting I'm pointing my mouse at things you guys can't see, so um, let me... Oh, we've lost our... No, we've lost our percentage of this tool. Pause, coming, so I can get zoom it back on here. And we're back. So, anyway, you'll see this is 0 and C. If I had a D drive and an E drive on this, that'd be a 0, C, D, E. If I had two disks attached here, I'd see a 0 and a 1, and whatever drive letters I had attached to that, and so forth. The difference between that and a logical disk is going to be pretty obviously too at this point. We would see the drives itself. I kind of covered this a little bit in a previous episode, but now you can see the difference. I have a C here, hard drives. So the only you know minor differences here, there's others, but you know one of the biggest ones is free space. There is no free space counter on a, a physical disk, but there are free space counters on the logical disk. So uh, either one is good. It really kind of depends if you've got several different drives on the same physical platter, then um, you know, wanting to look specifically at the D drive of that and see you know, what's causing I.O. just on that one drive, like if you know, maybe had some transaction logs or something like that going, uh, that'd be one way you could do that. Okay, so we're going to pick C as our object and or as our instance of the object logical disk and we're going to get some counters loaded up in here that are pretty important and uh, so we got read time, write time, idle time, so average disk per second read, average disk per second write, average disk queue length, percent of free space, and uh, disk transfers per second. Those are all primary counters. Well, they're not all primary counters. Read and write, these are your two primary counters. This is your initial indicators of latency. In fact, they are, uh, if we go through the trouble methodology, troubleshooting methodology of where did my server turn slow or where did my workstation turn slow or my PC or whatever, if um, we're going through all the different key indicators, these are the key indicators for disk. If these are high, that could be your problem. We're also going to do some process analysis potentially, so we're going to want some ability to tell what uh, you know what processes are creating disk I/O. So we'll go down here to process and its objects. We'll list all the instances of the ones on the box. We will hit all instances, and we want the I/O data operations per second. And Let's see, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to throw. Actually, we're going to do not IO data operations. We're going to do IO read operations, and we're going to do IO write operations per second for all instances of everything on here. Um, go ahead and throw those in. I can't shake the feeling that I am actually forgetting something here. Yep, we'll go with those. All right, so those are our counters that are going to be in this... We're going to put this on a three second sample interval because we're going to do really bad things to this in a big old hurry and I want to be able to catch them. So we're going to go next, we're going to go next, and we're going to go finish. And now we've got a data collector set and we're going to go ahead and start that sucker up and get her kicking. And right now the disks are looking pretty healthy. And if I look at the hypervisor, it also sees the disks is pretty healthy. So we're going to kind of do one and a half, no, we're going to do two and a half tests here. We're going to do one test where we throw a lot of I.O. at the disk using the box itself. 
And then we're going to have a, another test where we do not throw any data at the disk, uh, hardly at all. We'll do some, uh, but for the most part, we'll be kind of we'll be kind of running easy on this. And then we're going to uh, do both. We're going to have both of these guys uh, generate I/O. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to use a little tool called IOmeter or IOmeter, depending on where you are. And, how you prefer to pronounce it. If you haven't used this tool before, this is a great way to benchmark a disk. So I'm going to disconnect this one worker and I'm going to map this worker to the C drive and then I'm going to give it a test to run which is all in one. And that's really all I got to do except I want multiple workers to run. So I'm going to duplicate this worker so that he can throw um, jobs at this drive uh, for a little while. And I, I kind of don't want to kick this off if there's a whole lot of uh, uh, performance issues on the box because I don't want my test skewed. And so something just happened there where we, we kind of suddenly wrote a bunch of stuff to the disk and I'm not really sure what that was. But I'm going to, just to keep from getting skew, I'm going to stop the IO uh, bottleneck perfmon counter and we're going to create a new one. Because I want kind of a clean test here, because I really want him to be generating it from this other process. So that should be up and running. We should be seeing pretty good. Uh, oops, task manager, please. Yeah, so task manager's not really kicking it too hard. Whatever job that was that kicked off just a minute ago kind of beat it up a little bit. Uh, so let's let her run for just a few seconds here. And. Let's go ahead and kick off the uh, I.O. meter so we'll know that just roughly a few seconds after we started uh, this counter, we went ahead and kicked off I.O. meter. And I.O. meter is now kicking the disk up to 100%. We should see latency counters getting pretty high, and sure enough, we do. And if I move the other task manager over, we can see that the host very obviously sees that there's some, there's some uh, something amiss because it's seeing 100% active disk times. And we're going to go ahead and let that run for a few minutes and then uh, come back over and take a look at what we saw. OK, that's been probably enough time. So we'll go ahead and stop that test and let the disks kind of settle. And we can see here that both the Hyper-V host, or parent if you prefer, has kind of settled down after that little activity and so has the VM. So essentially what we just did was we emulated a situation where the disk on the uh, machine, whether it had been physical or not, had a job to do. In other words, this time if we were actually to go digging in, we should be able to actually identify a process. However, that isn't always the way things work and sometimes, as I mentioned, the process uh, that is the offending entity is not actually on the box itself. So we will kick up an IO meter on the hypervisor and that will be our next step here. All right, so kind of a similar thing here. What we're going to do is we're going to use Iometer to build us a nice job to simulate maybe a Hyper-V server that's overloaded or a VMware server that's overloaded or a server that uses SAN uh, for its storage and it's overloaded. But the, the machine itself, as you can see, is really not doing anything right now. So he's got no offending process that's going to create this. And this seems like a, a, an odd test maybe to you, but you don't know how many times I've seen this where we have uh, uh, people who think that they need to troubleshoot it on the server they have access to. <laughs> they don't look outside literally the box and uh, they're they're just seeing latency. They're 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 not thinking that you know the, maybe the latency is coming from the SAN or from the Hyper-V or VMware server that uh, that the the box is actually running on. So that's what we're doing now. So we're going to kick off a test, and we're going to start beating up this disk. And so you know we'll have um, you know busy disk showing up on the hypervisor. As you can see, I'm at 100%. But the 
the box itself isn't really doing anything. So he's actually, um, you know, he's just trying to do his thing. And, <clears throat> you know, he he's not, you know, he's not seeing any of this, this uh, activity. He doesn't get to see activity because, you know, that's not being reported to him. But the disk is incredibly busy. So if I were actually to kick some job up and going, you know, we're going to see some pretty decent latency uh, on this. And it doesn't have to be this kind of a job. You know, it can be just copying and pasting files, maybe. So I've got some large files in a folder here. If I wanted to take this 200 meg test file and make a copy of it, for instance, it's going to take longer for him to do these read and write operations to the point where it even frosts over the screen, as you can see, it's not responding. And, uh, you know, eventually he's going to complete the job, but now he's going to see in Task Manager quite a bit of uh, latency going on. So we're, we're out of spec for sure on the latency on uh, just this little copy operation, trying to copy a 200 meg file, because we're beating it up, we're beating up the disk, and, uh, you know, Iometer was able to do some work, but for some reason Explorer.exe can't even do a simple file copy right now without, without you know, kind of killing stuff. So, geez, I wonder if that's ever going to come back. <laughs> we've really, we've really made uh, this copy operation kind of the whole box is starting to become unresponsive, which is going to be very confusing to the OS because, geez, all it was doing was kind of kicking along. It doesn't have any activity measured. But, I mean, just a copy of a 2 meg five, five, a 200 meg file just, you know, took forever there. So, anyway, you can see how upstream from the server can definitely cause some issues for a local uh, box. It's either attached to a SAN because you, once again, you got your your whole fiber infrastructure there. You got your HBA card, and then you got your fiber channel SAN, and then you got the controller on the SAN, and you got the spindles on the disks inside the SAN. Just like if you were a, a, a virtual server, uh, it may actually even add an extra obs obfuscation level over there because you've got not only that but then you know the hypervisor itself is attached to a SAN so right there's a lot of different places where we can bottleneck and um, you know it, it'd be very confusing to the OS so those kind of uh, those kind of skew tests are uh, uh, why we're doing what we're doing so at uh, let's see 332 and I can't even get the time to come up on this silly thing Mm. There we go. Three, almost 3.33. We're going to go ahead and kick O-meter uh, off on this guy and leave him going for just a little bit. So now what we're doing is we're creating, uh, we're, we're creating I.O. on this D drive on the Hyper-V server, and we're also creating it on the C drive, which is the same drive, on the guest. And we'll just let that kick for a little bit here. That way we can kind of see what uh, you know what the the two are going to look like. Actually, th two and a half tests are going to look like the the test of the box loading itself up, a test where the box was loaded up uh, behind the scenes with uh, some job running on the dr same drive where he his his drive existed, and then a third test where he's actually now trying to put some load on the disks, uh, but he's unable to do so because the you know, the, the job that was already running was already uh, taking up all the I.O. cycle. So I'm going to let that run for just a minute, pause the video, and we'll come back. Okay, now that's run for about a minute, and that's good. So we'll go ahead and stop the I.O. on the VM, and he should see disk activity start to drop a little bit, even though probably he's catching up. There we go. He had a few bytes that were hung. Now we're going to turn off IOMeter on the uh, hypervisor, and now the hypervisor should see D drive start to calm down a little bit as it catches up a few lingering uh, wait time jobs there. And then from the perspective of the VM, things are starting to look a little healthier. We're starting to get uh, a couple of things going on, catching up maybe, I'm not sure, but we're now flatlined back to zero. Make sure we get a few capture of um, you know a couple of 
uh, uh, seconds, every three seconds we're obviously taking a kind of a quick little picture at what things look like. And that's probably plenty right there. So let's let's stop this. And we'll go back to the process of how we do this. So as a refresher, we go into this performance monitor guy and we go click our blue cube. We're going to go into our log files and we're going to come up a couple levels here and go to the uh, IO bottleneck. It was a failed attempt from previous. You remember we started and stopped and then restarted because I didn't like the way the disks were looking. So we wound up with a number two. So that's how those get, uh, that's that checkbox that said integer values. And we check our time range, and sure enough, we've got you know a good 15, 13, 12 minutes worth of data. And we load it up. There's nothing there, but we've got our two counters, so we can go in. Now we're going to start with the two key indicators. Remember, I said that we start off with the key performance indicators to tell us, hey, um, you know, what all we know at this point was server was slow. This server was slow. What do we do? Okay. Well, we're going to load up this processor counters, memory counters, disk counters, these these disk counters, and um, you know a handful of what I would call the you know the, the key indicators, uh, primary indicators of a problem, and figure out which one it is. Since we already know it's disk, no reason to load up anything else. And there we go. So we've got two very distinct patterns of problematic activity going on here. One of those is this area right here, when the disk was actually being loaded up by a process that we kicked off. And then over here, we saw another bit of uh, high activity. And uh, those are all in uh, average min max values here for you know the average read time was 47 milliseconds, where if you remember, 15 milliseconds is what we would consider to be high latency, and 25 milliseconds would be extremely high latency, or another way we could put that is we would warn at about 15 milliseconds of latency, and we would start to alert at 25 milliseconds of latency. So those uh, ERP packets, those little ERPs that are flying around, well, what we will uh, will consider to be the threshold values for those are 15 and 25 milliseconds respectfully. And here we saw 17 as an average and we saw a maximum of 1500. So again, if you are uh, looking at this 569 milliseconds of latency, that's as slow as a floppy drive. And that's bad. So we, we definitely want our hard drives to perform better. Uh, than our than our floppy drives, and we're not right now. And that's the overall time crunch. That's including this data that's uh, kind of here in the middle, right? So this area, we didn't really have any problems per se, because we were kind of letting it rest in between tests. And so we we were including uh, those in our in our samples. So let's look at some other favorite counters people like to see. At this point, what you've done is you've already pretty well looked at all of the other key uh, primary indicators to tell you where the problem was, and you've now come to the conclusion that we obviously had a disk problem. Everybody said the server was slow. You were wondering why it was slow. Now you know why it's slow. The disks were overwhelmed, right? So you can dump all your other counters at that point and start looking at your secondary and your tertiary counters and even your process analysis counters maybe but first we're going to look at some other things people used to look at the average disk queue length as a, as a, a really really big indicator of uh, performance bottlenecks but uh, did that not add? did I forget to click add? let me do that again logical disk uh, average disk queue length for C drive add okay there we go all right, so average disk queue length. I'm going to go ahead and scale that counter so I can see a pattern. And it's, it's not too terribly surprising for me to see that the packets were queuing uh, as we were seeing disk traffic. Right? So we were, we were seeing some packets get queued up. What you might see is kind of an odd and bizarre thing here is that we were queuing these packets right here. Oops, let me get that unfrozen. We were queuing about this many packets during a period of about this much latency. If you look at the re red and the green lines, 
and compare that to over here where we had just about the same amount of packets going around and queuing up but the latency was clearly off the scale compared to that so that that's that's kind of an uh, you know a key indicator in and of itself but it's not a primary counter that I would load up to go and figure out what the problem was so uh, we won't get too deep into that right now because we're, we're still kind of sleuthing around and and trying to figure out what the what the problem was at this point in time so uh, I, I also bring up this counter because everybody considers average just queue length to be a, a you know a, a big primary counter and I disagree uh, they even at one point had like numbers posted that would say how how much queuing you want to have and how little queuing you want to have uh, those are old school thoughts uh, if you're a if you're a laptop with one hard drive this actually can be a key indicator but there are better indicators that there's a problem if uh, you're talking about a server no because if you think about it you've got these once again these sans and um, you know, really fast attached storage system and RAID controllers uh, for your direct attached storage. And all of these things are capable of processing large quantities of queued packets and processing them very quickly. If I see high queuing but I see low latency, I don't care. That's why it's not a primary indicator. It's like an old buddy of mine used to say, um, his name's Clint Huffman, wrote a book on performance. And I mean, he wrote the book on performance. Uh, you know, Clint would say, you know, if I get in line at Starbucks, to go get my cup of coffee and there are 15 people in line ahead of me I'm bummed out it's a big queue right well not necessarily what if everybody in front of me didn't order frappa lappa cappuccino with cherry and nuts on top and you know took you know four minutes per person in line everybody just wanted a cup of coffee and wanted to go and I've got my cup of joe and I'm out the door in a minute and 20 seconds who cares if there were 15 people in line in front of me who cares really it isn't a problem. So why does it matter if I have a high queuing and a high disk queue length in my, uh, you know, in my disk queue if if the SAN is able to keep up, right? So I would never look at average disk queue length as a primary indicator. I'm looking at my latency counter. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that because I just don't care. I will look at it because if I see an a, a, an over time and a gradual increase of packet queuing on. Uh, on a, any particular disk and that disk is attached to a SAN that usually means that I probably have a fabric problem I may have an HBA controller for instance that I'm overwhelming uh, and that's causing packets to queue up but overall if I don't see an upward trend I'm not really paying attention to that counter all that much and I'm certainly not considering it a key performance indicator so we have already determined that there's latency here there's another piece before I go to process analysis and start digging in and start trying to determine whether or not there was some process on my box that was causing this issue what I need to do is find out was I the cause of this problem so disk transfers per second has no threshold it is not something that we would put a value to the higher the better that is simply how many ERPs per second we're shooting through the through the pipe and it's a good way to tell benchmark wise what this system is capable of doing so disk transfers per second can be like a you know a great little clue mechanism for you to uh, you know to, to go sleuth out and, and figure out what is that and what do I mean by that all right so first and foremost you can see that this thing was was shooting out 173 packets per second of data at its uttermost uh, point in time and that's probably right in here when I actually had IO meter going and what's really important to understand is right here during this point in time I'm I'm looking at upwards of 173 packets and I've, I've got latency right around in this area right and so I'm I'm pushing a, a good amount of data and I'm, I'm getting a fairly solid amount remember that you know 15 that's kind of my warning and right here 25 that's kind of my alert and those are those are not max values guys those are average values we got to remember that our our average value uh, throughout that period would be you know over 15 milliseconds then we're starting to get concerned 
But in this case, we I mean we are, but we're also expecting it because we're pushing a bunch of stuff. I mean you can see it. We are actually generating using you know looking at our disk transfers per second, we're generating a lot of data and we're creating a little bit of latency too. It's it's kind of in between overall, I'd say in between the warning, but not quite into the critical the whole time for any sustained period of time. Uh, but we are clearly over here over this imaginary you know warning line, right? We're we are clearly just out in the atmosphere on some of these packets on their latency times. And if, if you're if you're not quite catching it because the green line's covering the red line, look at my right times over here versus my right times over there. Why why is this way down here and this is way up here, off the charts in places on the on the highlighted one. So here's here's where the mystery starts to come to fruition. What I am looking at is to state it as succinctly as possible, if I am capable of generating this much I.O. with this much of latency, then why am I only generating this much I.O. but getting this much latency? Want a better picture? Let's zoom this sucker out and take a little bit of a look on some of the peaks and do our little add zero trick here. Add zero and apply and take a, a look at this perspective from above. Now what we're seeing is the real picture of there's your write times, there's your read times, and there's the amount of data I'm pushing through the system, disk transfers per second. So if I can write at this incredible amount of uh, you know flow, even though it's not real respectable, it is a VHD sitting on a SATA <laughs> hard drive in a laptop, um, but I mean still 173 packets per seconds going through and a minimal amount of latency but out here I'm I'm generating hardly any data at all and I'm getting massive amounts of latency so these are two different sequence of events that you're looking for and from this point if you have this example you need to go figure out you know maybe you need to go figure out it just depends on how bad the situation was you may need to go figure out what on your box is causing the problem if you're looking at data that looks like this that means you need to go figure out what on your network or your SAN or your hypervisor or whatever server in the same rack or whatever server it is that is sharing the same backend storage uh, before um, is causing this latency because it's not you. It makes no sense with this example on the right to go to process analysis looking at your processes to see who was creating the most disk IO makes no sense at all and is the number one mistake I see even seasoned IT professionals do when they get into a situation like this because they see high latency they immediately start looking to see where the latency is coming from without error first checking to see if the, the problem was coming from their box or not. Alright so if it's here you're pretty much done right at this point there's nothing Nothing you're going to be able to do from this local server to determine why you're getting this kind of read and write latency on a box because you're not generating the issue and it helps to be able to have a picture of what good looks like because you need to know this you need to know that at you know at, at some point in time in the past your server was able to push a high amount of data through the pipe and get a, a, a fairly respectably low amount of latency at that period of time right and it if uh, you know if you have that benchmark data saved somewhere or if you just took a capture long enough you'll see it you know if you took data captures for longer than the 12 minutes we did and you ran it for several hours you're gonna see your server go out and push or your laptop go out and push some data around and once you've seen it go push some data around then you should see a period somewhere in there like this where you see kind of the top end of that's as much data as it'll go I mean it's pretty obvious right this thing <laughs> this thing hit as much as it could get right it, it just kept bouncing off the ceiling. It was, you know, kind of like my nine-year-old, right? But, it, but it, hopefully that concept is with you now. So what we're going to talk about next is what happens if this is your situation, right? I saw high amounts of latency, and I was the one generating the data. I need to know what on my box is actually creating that data. So that's what we're going to do here in this next part. So first we'll go ahead and we're going to go ahead and um, my mouse has completely lost touch with this virtual machine. Ah, there we go. All right, so we're going to we're going to go ahead and dump these counters. Well, maybe we're Oh, I'm still that's yeah, duh. I still got my Okay. So we know it's this box. We know that the problem 
was um, which was higher was it read or write which one's the easier one to do let's do first off let's set our graph back down to Earth's atmosphere and let's go back because I kind of forgot which one was higher and of course we need to go back and put the graph in the atmosphere to see just to get an user so clearly the uh, the right times were the the worst of the two which I suppose since it was iometer we wouldn't be too terribly surprised about that so if it's right times we'll just start with right operations we're gonna do all instances of all the processes and we're gonna dump them in here and don't forget that whenever you're looking at a problem you need to kind of have an idea in mind of when the problem was because you don't want to be looking at average minimum and maximum times or data in a, a time frame that is not relevant to when the problem was because you can really easily fool yourself and that and that's bad typically when you do what I just did you need to um, uh, remember that the um, oops let me just see 200 I'm pretty sure there's nothing stuck up there I'm gonna check real quick yeah there's one that kind of spiked up there but that's that's kind of unimportant we'll leave this there usually when you dump a lot of counters in just like this what do you do you want to not scale all the counters if you do things are just gonna go all over and completely be screwed up so let me give you an idea if I do this and to scale all the selected counters how can I tell which one is actually the bad guy now you know I might select this guy right here but look at him he's scaled up by 100 right so he he's actually been skewed in and of himself and I might I might even think that maybe this little blue guy here is is the bad guy and he's scaled up a hundred so you just took all your big ones and pushed them down and you took all your little ones and pushed them up and you skewed what you're looking at so that's why we scale the graph when all the counters are the same and we scale our uh, oops we scale our uh, uh, counters when all of the counters are different so write operations, all instances, add, okay. Don't forget to go ditch total, because, yeah. Which, by the way, total, if you looked at there, there <laughs> was almost identical to whoever this guy is. Right? Have your highlighter on. Go in here, click them. If it matches the condition, which obviously this is the same pattern, and if we need proof, we can go into our logical disk and do our average disk per second write times for C, and we can dump them in here and click that, and then we take our... Do, 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 do. average disk per second right and eh, do we want to scale it it doesn't really matter it's just remember that this you know this counter is lower than that counter because they're measuring different things one is average disk operations per second right and this is actually IO right operations per second so believe it or not those two are actually different right so they're going to be measuring at a different rate plus it's all of them together Right? and this guy is just one so he got scaled down just to be able to fit on the graph but he's obviously a correlative pattern and if we want to really show that let's go ahead and dump everybody else because we found our culprit very easily just by doing that little trick there and let's just leave those two guys on the screen together and there you go pretty pretty obvious right we've got a, a very good correlation between those and if I were to put the read operations in for dynamo in, and the read operations per second uh, average disk per second read for C and logical disk for dyno, uh, IO write operations, read operations rather for dynamo. C dynamo. Click OK. Now we've, we've got the whole picture. All right, so we've got our IO read and write. Uh, sorry, read operations and uh, latency counters down here matching that pounder there IO operations here zoom out and you can see as we go through here how we kind of kicked off our second test right there which also matched some of those uh, latency figures but they are in pretty good direct correlation we started seeing latency here at the exact same time those guys kind of flipped out and who are those guys? Well, that's Dynamo. So what's Dynamo? Well, Dynamo is actually the sub-process of IOMeter. And you can't even run IOMeter without a Dynamo. It's sitting in the same directory, oops, 
sitting in the same directory where IO meter is. So now we know what process is generating the, uh, the amount of IO. So what do you do from here? From here you get past perfmon. Right? So at this point you need to even figure out is that normal, is that not normal? It could be very normal that that program generates a lot of high I.O. from time to time and is going to cause latency on your box and maybe you need your disks uh, realigned in a way that they uh, you know, give you more IOPS. Talk to your sand vendor, tell them hey I need more IOPS on this, uh, I, I need more IOPS on, on this uh, LUN because we're you know we're getting latency from it and we're not getting what we expected back from the SAM so I need I need more I need more power I need more power Mr. Sulu so um, or Scotty God that was a terrible faux pas so we we do need um, to possibly help the person who wrote this program to make sure we're not doing uh, you know something silly like continuously reading from our own executable a million times during some random call stack that is written in some sub procedure in the uh, in the executable someplace so little things like that can be done by using process monitor you could use process uh, monitor to kind of look and see what it is during these periods of time that is causing si such high IO but 90% of the time what I find is that we found the application and it's either underpowered server or there's a bug in the app right it's going to be one way or the other and as a system administrator or just some person out there that's helping somebody fix their computer you you have found the problem you know what the problem is you have uh, you have great data here and if you need to like even submit this to management you know here's a tip go in and do stuff like this and give these very easy to read colors and line thicknesses so that when you present this to them it uh, you know becomes very obvious to them what we're looking at right if you if you can follow me through to the end so you're gonna give you're gonna paint a picture <laughs> and be able to use that picture so that you can back your data. You know, you can show, you know, extremely, amazingly, surprisingly, shockingly high latency and, um, you know, in, in the other piece, <laughs> in this case it wasn't so bad, but that's what you want to do is paint the picture of whatever you saw and wherever it came from and put it up in pretty charts and colors so that uh, the folks that you're presenting this to can see what you're talking about because you got real world data, you got real actual stuff that you can look at uh, here. And the same goes for this over there, right? You would do the same thing if you were trying to go to the uh, people who maybe run the uh, the Hyper-V or VMware servers and they're telling you, oh no, I'm not seeing anything wrong, man. We're, you know, we, we've been looking at these hypervisors all day and they haven't had a problem. And you bring this up and show it to them. Say, well, look, I've got very little data going through and what I'm looking at is an incredibly large amount of latency, right? Whereas on another point in time in the same day, I showed a very high amount of data that we pushed through with a very low amount of latency. So you explain it to me. Mr. Hyper-V expert or Mr. VMware vSphere expert, why is it that I am absolutely not pushing any data but I'm getting just mass quantities of latency? And that can help you to speak Sanish as again my buddy uh, Clint Huffman was uh, great at, uh, at pointing out, he even wrote a blog article about that one time, very very fun stuff, uh, to be able to communicate back with the people who are in charge of your disk fabric and uh, be able to communicate in a language that they understand. So that's, uh, that's really kind of the biggies on getting down to the root of when you have decided that the problem on your box is storage related, uh, you're disk bound in some way, uh, you got to find out is it really you or not, and then after that, process analysis, figure out which one of the programs on the box it was that caused the problem. And there you go. So anyway, guys, this has been Chris with Microsoft. As always, I thank you so much for watching. If you found anything about this useful or interesting, please uh, take a second and give me a quick like. I, I sure would appreciate it. It also helps to you know, give it exposure so that other people will uh, see the video too. Um, also, feel free to subscribe to my channel. That gives you a notification anytime I put out anything new. 
And um, just to let you know, my blog is at 9z.com. It's super easy to remember. It's just the last number followed by the last letter, dot com. It's also got links to my Facebook, my LinkedIn, my Twitter, and uh, my TechNet blog. And so again, as always, thanks a ton for listening, and I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you.